Well, I appreciate y'all having me out here to listen to me for a little bit, and I thank Jeremy for giving me the opportunity to come up here and speak for a minute. So uh, when he called me, he mentioned doing something for Unity Weekend. So um, first thing that started like spinning in my mind, you know, he, he explained to me that it's about getting to know each other. And I guess if you, know, you kind of want to know about me, hey, if you don't know me, I like to mess with cars, mess with trucks, and I've been going to Pleasant Hill since I was about third grade is whenever I started coming out here, but, you know, uh, talking about things that I've done here, you know, you, Brother Milton talks, he's, he's mentioned about uh, you drag in and you drag up and you drag out, and I've done that before. I've been in that part, you know, in that, in that position in my life where you just kind of, you roll in, and sometimes I don't get to the point where I feel like I socialize, basically, as much as I feel like I should, because, you know, we're all human, and the devil, he's always on our case, and there's a lot of times where I don't feel like I get to know people as much as I feel like I should, so this, this weekend is, is really cool to see you guys be able to, to sit with folks you don't necessarily talk to a whole lot and get to converse and, and just learn about each other and, and learn about our testimonies. So that's kind of what I wanted to share is uh, kind of my walk with Christ and how, how I've basically come to here today. So um, where we're going to be is actually in Romans chapter 10, and I'm going to be in verse 9 and uh, read through 11. But while you guys are flipping there, when Jeremy called me, uh, he, he mentioned that it was going to be called Unity Weekend. And from that point, uh, the first thing I did as soon as I got off the phone from him was I went and immediately sat at my computer and I wanted to see what the definition of unity was. Because, you know, we all know that unity kind of means something is together, something is one. But I wanted to kind of see what, what's a, a legit definition. What is something that's going to be, you know, better than what Dylan has to say. So I looked it up. I found on Google, I looked up the definition that says uh, the state of being united or joined as a whole. I mean, that's kind of pretty surface level. It's not much more than what I had actually explained, but uh, it, it's fairly good. But I wasn't satisfied. I didn't feel like that was really enough as far as uh, what I was looking for. I was kind of looking for a little bit more in depth as far as what the meaning was. So on Google, what you can do, you know most people, and I do it too, you just hit the first one that pops up, and there you go, you're done. But I did a little bit more scrolling, and Google has this recommended search that pops up in the, like what it might think that you want to look for, what you're looking for in, a, in something. And it said, what is the true definition of unity? Or what, you know, what's the true meaning at that point? And I copied it here, and this, it says the state or fact of being united or combined into one. And I like that into one because we talk a lot about oneness in these verses that I'll read here in a minute. And oneness with Christ and one way to heaven, one God, one true God, one Savior. And then it goes on to say, as of the parts or a whole, unification, absence of diversity. And it's funny now in 2021, absence of diversity is going to get you in trouble if you say that anywhere else. So, but here it's not talking about, you know, where your background is, whether you're black, whether you're white, or where girl, none of that. It's not talking about that kind of diversity. It's talking about that oneness, that, that belief that we are all within Christ, that absence of diversity, because we all believe one thing. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he was sent here to save our, our, us from our sins. And that absence of diversity really rung out with me because the Bible does not change. It does not diversify itself to fit a person. We have to change ourselves to fit what the Bible says because the Bible's been there since day one. It's going to be there from now on to eternity, and it's not going to change. You know, it's not going to diversify itself. There's the absence of that diversity. And then this definition goes on. It says, in varied or uniform character, oneness of mind. And that oneness is something that we'll touch on here in just a second. So keep that in mind. It's a oneness of mind and feeling uh, as among a number of persons, like we are here, a concord, harmony, or agreement meaning that we are in agreement that Jesus is the Son of God, and what we believe is what the Bible teaches us. Now, uh, now we'll go ahead and dive into uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and uh, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And I, I really like these verses because it's as simple as it gets for the story of salvation. It makes it very easy for someone who doesn't know, who's someone who hasn't been raised up in the church. It's something that they can read. I mean, it's instructions for what our salvation is. And I've taken these verses here, and I, I go on a road trip. I mentioned that I, I work on cars a lot. I do a road trip every year, and I take these verses right here, and I'll put them on the, the glass of the car, on the back glass so that people can see it as I'm driving down the road. And because I want them to look at that. I mean, if someone is a non-believer, I feel like these verses can really break down what it takes to be a Christian. And I really like verse 9 because it's, it's kind of a two-parter. It says, you know, there's two ifs in this verse. There's the first if, it says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, meaning if you confess that He is God, He is the one true Savior, and then there's a second if, shall, and if you shalt believe in thine heart that, uh, that God hath raised him from the dead, you know, after the third day after he was crucified, that he was raised up from the dead, what happens? What is the, what's the then in that if-then statement? If you believe those two things, thou shalt be saved. I mean, it's, it's about as easy as it gets right there. I mean, it really simplifies everything down. So um, I guess for, for myself, I wanted to kind of share my testimony and where... I kind of came from. Now, uh, growing up, I went to Maranatha Baptist Church, just you know, not too far down the road here. And growing up, I was there in church. I was there on every Sunday, every Wednesday. Did all sorts of VBS. Did you know? Did every kind of youth thing or church trip or whatever you, you may think of it. I was there. I was in all about it. I mean, I learned a lot about the Bible at Maranatha, and kind of learned some things and, and was taught a whole lot of stuff. So I was always around the Bible, but I wasn't always saved. And when I was seven years old, I remember going to mom and dad one night and uh, telling them that, hey, I'm really scared to go to hell. And it was just, it was bothering me because I was hearing all these preachers talk about uh, what it's like to go to hell. All these people are going to hell. And I'd seen people go up and they, they would say, I'm saved now. And I, I really truly didn't understand what that meant. And, you know, went to the, the preacher, uh, re, uh, repeated the verse or the, the prayer that he said. He asked me, do you believe that you've been saved? And I said, yeah, but I didn't know what that meant. I really didn't at seven years old really have an understanding or a grasp of what it meant to be saved. And, uh, I, you know, went through, got baptized. That was round one. So we've got two more to go. So there's, I'll go ahead and give you that. We, we went through three times. But the first one... Uh, uh, at seven years old at Maranatha. And then uh, that, when I was in third grade, we ended up moving here to Pleasant Hill over at the old church. And, you know, grew up there. It was Again, was at every Sunday, every Wednesday, VBS. Uh, went to every kind of youth trip or, or any kind of, like, church event. You know, we were there. We did everything like that. And growing up, I was... When you go into middle school and high school, it's kind of where you're trying to learn about yourself and try to figure out who you are as a person. And it's really hard to figure out who you are as a person without having God to show you who you should be as a person. And I, I struggled with that. And I would always tell myself, you know, you said the prayer when you were in seventh or when you were seven years old. You did this. You did what you were supposed to. So you're, you're good to go. Uh, I thought, yeah, I did it. I, I, I don't act like all these things that these preachers talk about. But I knew something was missing about me. I could tell that deep down, every time that I would go and come into the, the church, I would, at some point, you know, when Pleasant Hill gets on fire, they get on fire for God. And, you know, it's just about every Sunday we've got somebody getting up, ta uh, testifying, shouting, and singing as loud as they can. And that's something that we should be excited about, something that should really get us on fire too. But I, felt, I found myself reeling back. And there were times when I'd get up and walk out and go to the bathroom and just stay there until it was over because I was so nervous. I was sitting in there just like my heart was racing. I was sitting there telling God, I said, yeah, I'm going to be okay. You know, I promise you from this point on, I'm going to be better. I, believe me, things are going to be different from this point. But that was never the case. I would just tell myself that, get past the invitation hymn, and then continue living my life as I, as I was when I shouldn't have been doing that. And fast forward to 
going on the Georgia trip now. I know a lot of you, the young folks, they've been on the Georgia trip or they're going to be on the Georgia trip. It's a lot. If you've ever been to it, you know that it is, it's very amazing the things that you see while you're on that trip. And I got to where I was not wanting to go anymore because they, I mean, they throw it to you when you go on that trip. And it's 24-7 for a whole weekend. I mean, and what they do, I mean, they set it up to where you can have this really, really close-knit group of people, and they are just on fire for God nonstop. And it's a really good opportunity for, for young people to kind of open up and, and experience what God wants for them. And I remember it was 2013. I'm sitting there, and I've been dreading going through this whole trip, okay? It was hard to go through that trip because I knew something wasn't right. And I remember it was the last day on the Saturday because you go on Saturday for, before lunch and then you leave. And we, had, we were getting through that. The invitation hymn was going. I mean, people are crying. It's, it's just going crazy. And I remember there was somebody sitting next to me and they, they were talking about how they were having dealings with Christ and they were wanting to be saved, but they just didn't know what to do and they were going through it. And God, he's dealing with me. And I knew what to do. That person next to me, didn't grow up in church you know they didn't have all the information that I already had so I should have known better and I remember I told God I said all right if this person right here goes up I know you're calling me but if this person here goes up I'll go up with them and sure enough 30 seconds later they stood up and went to the the altar and got saved so I said all right God I'll keep my promise I went up there too and I prayed a prayer, did all the, went through the motions, checked the box, was good to go. And we got back on the bus, but I still felt that feeling, like something wasn't right. Something wasn't setting with me right. I didn't have that, that connection with God that I felt I should have. And I was sitting there, and everybody's hugging and crying, and, and that person that had gone up was telling everybody. But I, I only, I texted my mom and dad, said, hey, headed home, by the way, got saved. See ya. That's it. I didn't tell anybody on the bus. My own sister was on the bus, and she went to the trip with us. And she didn't find out till we got home. And I knew something was wrong because uh, in verse 10, it talks about, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I wasn't excited. I didn't want to tell people because I was embarrassed, because I knew that something wasn't right, because what I did was I didn't let myself make the decision. God was calling me. And I didn't make the decision for myself. That person sitting next to me made the decision. It was not me who went up there and actually made the decision to go get saved. And I, I realized that I'd put my faith in someone else's hands. And it's up to me what I do. It's up to me to accept that call from God, and I put it all on somebody else. So I kept telling myself again, hey, Dylan, you did the right thing. You're okay. You know, every time that we... I'd get under conviction, I'd tell God, you know, I, I did this. I, I, you watched me do it, right? I said the prayer. I did the thing. I've gone to church. I've been here and there. Everything should be fine, right? But it wasn't. I knew something wasn't right. And so fast forward, I graduate high school, go into college. And college, if, you know, high school is where you're trying to find yourself. And then college is 10 times worse. I'll tell you that right now. Because the colleges want you to believe that you can be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want without any kind of repercussion for it. They don't think that you should have any kind of responsibility for your actions. And, and that was kind of where it was leading towards me. Because I would only come here maybe every other Sunday if I could. And I'd only get to go Sunday morning. So my connection with Christ was getting, you know, that, that draw that he had on me was starting to get weaker and weaker and weaker to the point where I couldn't hear him at all anymore. Hardly, unless I came here on Sunday mornings. And... And I, I, I mean, I, I did things in, in college, and I, I lived a life that I shouldn't have, and I was putting things before God the whole time. And the way that I've talked about it to my, uh, my Sunday school class is that, you know, you've, you've got yourself here, you've got God here, and you've put something blocking the communication between the two of you. And it's kind of like if you're looking at a, a creek, and, you know, as kids, we all did it. You know, you, you build up a, a dam in the middle of the creek, you redirect the flow of water, and you just kind of push it, you know, make it do whatever you want it to. And that's what I was doing. I'm over here, standing here. God's a straight connection of communication with that water flow. He's going to go straight to you, but as soon as you start blocking it, 
building up those rocks, building up that dam, building up something that's blocking it, that water's going to go right around you because you're pushing it away. And that's what I was doing. I just kept saying, no, God, I did what you wanted me to do. I checked the box. I'm a good person. I promise you I did what I was supposed to. And I did get baptized the second time, so now we're on round three. This is where we're, we're going to come up to the final. So now this all wrapped up in April 2nd of 2017. I was uh, actually over at the new church. I was still, or the old church. I was still in college, come home from sun, for a Sunday weekend. And it just so happens that's when Daniel Couch had come uh, through Pleasant Hill and shook some things up. And I remember I couldn't tell you what he was preaching on. I couldn't tell you what Bible verse he was in. I had no idea. But I remember he was lighting people up. And I was, sitting, I was sitting on this side over here on the second row right on the corner and had like three or four people next to me. And I remember he walked up to our row and he pointed at this person right here. He said, are you saved? And they said, yes or no. He said, are you saved? And they said, yes or no. And the person who was next to me, they, he said, are you saved? And he said, no. Or she said, no. And, I, and it stuck with me. Because like, that honesty that they had, and I'm over here, I'm gripping the pew, I'm shaking, I'm nervous, my heart's racing, and I bet he had to see my face and I was white as a ghost. I guarantee you he had to know. And so he's, he's coming up to me, and then he turns around. He don't ask me the question. He just went right by. And I thought, oh, thank you, Lord. He didn't ask me. He didn't ask me if I was saved or not. I don't have to answer the question. Thank you very much. And then that's when it hit me. Why is it that it bothered me so much that he was going to ask me about my salvation? Why is it that I can't stand up in front of this church and tell everybody about my salvation? And I realized, well, that's because I don't have it. I didn't have that that connection, that unity with God. And I'll tell you what, I still was just so stubborn because we went through probably three or four invitations I tell you, we just kept going. It felt like the longest 10 minutes of my life. I mean, I I was standing there. I was just gripping that pew. I I looked down at my hands, and they were just white because how hard I was holding on to that pew. Heart's racing. I'm sweating. But I didn't want to go up there because I didn't want people to think that, oh, Dylan's not saved. He wasn't saved this whole time because I had actually been filling in for our Sunday school class, teaching the class in there and, uh, and teaching the college and career folks. What's that going to look on us? How is that going to look on me if I wasn't saved that whole time? But that didn't matter. I, and I pushed, I pushed through that invitation, and I finally thought, oh, man, we did it again. We got through another one. All right, we're good to go. All I got to do is drive back to school, nothing to worry about. So I get up after everybody's shaking hands, and, and it was after, after the service was over. I get up, and I walk from over here, and uh, J.W. Brown was sitting right about here, and I leaned up against, because I would always go talk to him after service, and I would just lean it up against that, that pew like this, looking at my feet, just kind of kicking the ground. And he walked up to me and he said, are you okay? And at that moment, when he asked me if I was okay, I broke down. That was it. I said, no, I'm not. And I started bawling. And he said, well, come on, let's pray. And I walked over here, that old church, right down here on the right side, and I prayed my heart out. I gave it all I had. And I told God everything that he didn't already know. He was just waiting on me, waiting on my part. He had already done his half. I just needed to meet him halfway. And I tell you what, when I stood up, I was relieved. I felt something different. My hands were, I couldn't hardly stand up. My knees were buckling. That's how excited I was and relieved I was. That adrenaline finally had let go. And I was just standing there like this. I couldn't believe it. And what, what really set in with me was what verse 11 says. It says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And at that point, I'll tell you right now, I went and told everybody I could find. Guess what just happened to me? I want you to know that I just got saved. Everything's going great now. I'm glad I did this. And I was calling people, texting people, said, You won't believe what just happened. At that point, I knew that, hey, something had really changed in my life. And that's what this is all about, is... That unity that we have with Christ, not only with him, but also with us as a, a, a church body. Those who are with Christ, those who are saved, we are one people. I want to read some verses that, you know, I, I found the meaning of, of uh, uh, unity in Google, 
from a dictionary, but what does the Bible say is the meaning of unity? So I'll just read a few here. It says Romans 12, verses 4 and 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body of Christ, in Christ, and every one members one of another. So it's saying that not only are we members with Christ, but we're members with each other. We have that unity. We have that connection. We have that, that unvaried or uniform character, that oneness of mind. We have all of that together, that we have that connecting us through Christ. And then Romans 15, 6 says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, meaning we don't twist what the Bible says. We hear what the Bible says, and we, and we tell other people what the Bible says. We don't, we don't twist it. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. So if we live in peace with Him, He's going to live in peace with us. You know, As we're here tonight, God's here with us. He's with us in everything if we allow Him to be. We just have to bring Him into our lives and, and let Him take control of the situation. And then Philippians 2.2 2 says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And then finally, 1 Peter 3.8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And, and that's what, as, as the men here, that, that, uh, that love as brethren. I mean, we are, we're a family. We're a family in Christ. If we're all saved, then we are together through all this. And we have people to, to rely on. And kind of wrap this thing up. This is what this Unity Weekend is about. To find folks who are, are willing to help you. You know that you don't have to go through anything alone because you've got Christ to fall back on as well as the people in this church. I mean, there's, there's so many people here who'd be willing to help. You just have to be willing to do that and accept that. But uh, again, we're, uh, the Unity, of this Weekend of Unity is, is, is awesome. I'm excited for it. And I hope you guys are as well. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. It's good to know that I'm not the only three-timer. Y'all have heard my testimony. Uh, <clears throat> That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I wouldn't feel right. I was sitting there after that. Um, I wouldn't feel right without having an invitation of some sort. I'm not going to ask anybody to come up and sing or play. I'm just going to ask you all to bow your heads. Awesome. Uh, Richard's going to share with us this morning. Y'all pray for him that uh, wouldn't be as nervous as probably as he can be, but, uh, but that we would be open and receptive to what God has laid on his heart to share with us. So I'll, uh, I'll lead us, but we all pray together for Richard and, when, uh, and the rest of the day going forward. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Thank you for these group of men. And boys, Lord, and what they mean to me, Lord, help us to be there for one another, love each other, and uh, just help each other, Lord. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being that ultimate sacrifice for us, Lord, and allowing your blood to be shed for us so that we could have forgiveness of sin. Lord, help us to honor you with our lives. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, all right, I'd like to, uh, Jeremy, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and uh, speak in front of you guys. I'm not, I'll be the first to tell you, I am not uh, a public speaker. This is, uh, if you'd ask me, hey, Richard, uh, I got a Unity Weekend coming up. 
I'd like for you to speak. God's laid on my heart for you to either speak or maybe we could go and skydive together. I probably would have been hopping on a plane with you because this is not me. <laughs> I'd say words of plane. Um, I sit right over there pretty much every Sunday sitting on my hands. I mean, I, I love the Lord, but I'm not, uh, I'm not an out and open type of person. That's just, that's, that's just kind of how I am. And, um, <clears throat> and I'll be just 100% honest with you, Jeremy. You went back and forth between the weekends of which one to do, which one not to do. We had a vacation coming up, and I was hoping that it would not land on me. <laughs> so, uh, but praise God for his plan. Praise God for his plan in our life. He's got, a, a <clears throat> he's got every minute of every day planned out for us. And I'm, I apologize for hoping against it, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that I got to be here and got to do this and study a lot about it. I think it was, I know it was good for me. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> but anyways, through college, my, uh, my most dreaded class was speech. It, I would go in, I would, uh, I would lock up, I could take any other class, physics, chemistry, whatever, didn't bother me. I'd walk into a speech class and I would just, I would lock, I would lock up, it would just kill me. So uh, I hope this shows you how much I love you and I, I do appreciate this, this opportunity for sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm ashamed for, for not uh, speaking about my Jesus enough. Um, this has really been a, a slap in my face. Uh, how, can I, how can I not talk about Christ? How can I not stand up over there and tell uh, everybody what, what Jesus has done for me, what my Father in Heaven has done for me? Uh, there's, there's somebody out there that, that stood in between me and an, and an eternal hell. And um, here I'm trying not to get up here and talk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop uh, tearing myself down and uh, <clears throat> get into it here. Luke 9, 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his, and in his Father's and of the holy angels. And that speaks volumes to me. How can I, how can I, I'm not ashamed, but how can I not be bold enough to speak of Christ? And if we're ashamed of him here, he says it right there, he said, I'll be ashamed of you when we come in front of the Father. So it doesn't get much plainer than that. The closer I got to this weekend, I, when we first, you know, first said and I agreed to do it, um, it just tore me apart. I just... <laughs> I just thinking back to the times where I've had to do speeches and in school and be in front of people and I would just I would just I would melt and I would sweat. It just it would tear me apart. Um, the closer I got to this weekend and I just constantly prayed and I know I had people praying for me about it, the, the better I felt, the stronger I felt, and uh, I felt a peace about it and uh, I'm just so glad to be here right now. Uh, Satan was definitely at work. Anytime, I feel like anytime you're trying to do the Lord's work, you're trying to do something uh, to, to further the kingdom, the devil's going to be on you. Satan's going to be on you. He's going to be attacking you. He was attacking me. He was telling me how worthless my past was, how uh, I haven't been, I, I haven't done enough for God. What do you care? Because, you know, you hadn't even done anything you won't. You won't uh, get up in front of the church. You don't. You're not active in church enough. And uh, and I know that's Satan. I know that he was uh, he was trying to beat me up. And uh, and I recognize that. And uh, and I've, I've I believe I've become stronger. And I've learned to uh, to fight that and fight him. So I never spoke in church. I never sp stood up and gave my testimony. So I've got, uh, I've got some catching up to do here, and I'm going to do my best. Um, <clears throat> God's been good to me, and I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't hide that. I can't, I can't hide that anymore. So uh, I'm going to start in the beginning, and uh, 
when I say the beginning, I'm not talking about when I was born, when I was a little bit kid. Uh, the, to me, the beginning of a man's real life uh, is the day that he gets saved, the day that he, he surrenders and uh, admits that he's a sinner and, uh, and turns it over and just gives it to God. That's, to me, that's, that's when a man's life really starts. The other stuff's important, too. We've got to be born, and babies are cute and all that. But uh, to, live a life, to live a life for God, to live a life for our Father in Heaven, that's where, that's where the good stuff is. Um, <clears throat> so I was 11 years old. Uh, I grew up in a house where my mom and dad were both, I, I mean, I, I have nothing to complain about. My mom and dad were both, they were both saved. Uh, we were in church. Kept us very, very busy in the church. Kept us... Uh, you know, Sunday school, Wednesday night, VBS, church camp. We, uh, we were very active in the church. We were, I had a ton of exposure to, uh, to God's Word, and a lot of exposure to, uh, to, to the teaching of Christ. But I didn't have it. I didn't have, I, d- I knew I didn't have what I needed. I knew I did, I had, there was a hole in me. There was something missing in me. And, uh, and I knew that uh, I could see my parents, I could see their peace, and I could see, uh, I could see that they had something I didn't have, and I knew I wanted that. Um, I didn't know exactly how to get it. I'd been told how, but you know, you can be told how, but uh, until you feel that calling in your heart, you just, it's just going to be words. Um, so I knew I was missing something. I knew there was sin in my life. I knew that... Uh, I knew, there was, I, I knew that there was an internal hell waiting for me, and it scared me. And, uh, I, and I, but I also knew I didn't need to do anything out of fear. So on a Sunday morning, uh, the preacher was preaching, and wasn't even really even talking about salvation, but it was just, it was pounding in my heart. It was, uh, I felt God calling, calling me. It's like, hey man, you need to, you need to get this straight, and you need to come to me. We need, we need a relationship. So, uh, so I went forward just out of the blue. Uh, the church was, was just about over, and uh, he did his invitation like he always does, and my parents didn't have a clue I was going up. They were like, are you going to the bathroom, or what, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going up here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting saved. This is it. I'm, I'm ready. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. I hadn't really even talked to them about it. I probably should have. But um, so I went up in front of the church and uh, was just excited, and I felt I felt. God called me, and I, I felt the change, and uh, never looked back. And what uh, one of the things that just I just it filled me the most was I knew that I was in my Father's hands from that point on. Never be never be pulled out. Nothing can ever take our salvation. And I knew I was good. I knew I was I was in such better shape. So um, went on back to school. I was a kid. Uh, I was nowhere near perfect. I, I knew I had a lot of growth yet to do. Um, I had a, I mean, honestly, I had a filthy mouth, a filthy, filthy mind. Uh, I wasn't where God wanted me to be. Uh, the difference was conviction. And I, I thank God for my conviction. I, I thank God for the conviction I have today. Um, the farther away I would get from where God wanted me to be, the, the more he broke me down. And uh, throughout my school years, I was hot and cold when I was younger. Uh, I knew the, the difference was I knew the truth. And, uh, and I had a, a relationship with my, with my father in heaven, with Christ. Um, but I didn't always choose to, to follow him. And, uh, and I am ashamed of that. But the, the good thing is that I'm looking at a bunch of sinners out in front of me right now. So... You know we're uh, we're all in this together. So my uh, where I made the biggest change in my life was when I got into college. Uh, so Jeremy, we talked about this. You know, you wanted to kind of focus on the maybe the men, my age group, kind of, and um, and the Unity Weekend. Uh, so when I get to college. And I know college for a lot of people is wild parties, uh, frat parties, sororities, all that kind of stuff. Luckily, 
God had a plan for me that was different from that. I had some uh, real good friends from, from Lincoln County that I went there with. Um, one of them had just been saved. And uh, we, we went on mission work. We did uh, mission work in Honduras together, two different summers. Um, we, were, we were insanely active at MTSU. And uh, we went to Raiders for Christ, which is a Church of Christ group. There was Church of Christ there. There was tons of Baptists there. There was Methodists there. We, uh, the biggest thing was we were, uh, our core was Christ. Our core was scriptural based, no matter what we did. Um, I mean, we, were, we were so active. Monday night we did devotionals. Tuesday night we picked up uh, inner city kids. Wednesday night we had our regular, we'd go to a regular church. And Thursday night we had small group. It was, it was just not the same uh, college experience that I'd heard about. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. And I'm, I'm hoping that these, the young ones here, when they get to college, that they, they know what to focus on. Because there's, there's so much, gosh, MTSU is, is just riddled with sin. And, and most of these college campuses are. And it's a scary place to send your kids. Um, there's just so much. Uh, Satan is so strong on these campuses. Uh, there's a lot of liberal ideas that they have to be real careful of. So uh, we need to be praying for our kids that are going to college. We need to be praying for, uh, for them to, to hold strong in what they learned here in this house. So at, at that point, I was already engaged with Hillary, and uh, I knew I had a path for my life, or I, I had a rough path for my life, I guess. Um, but in my college years, my, my mind was, I was, I'm preparing to be out on my own. I'm preparing to be married and live the life that God wants me to live uh, with my wife and my kids. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, Hillary is a product of this church. And uh, I can tell it. She is an encouragement. She is a, a godly woman. And I've been very blessed to have her uh, where, where either one of us falls short, the other one picks the other one up. And uh, I pray for all you boys not married uh, that you find a good godly woman. It'll, uh, it'll make all the difference in your world and in your lives. Uh, you need to focus on that. There's a lot of stuff that you don't need to be focusing on. You need to be focused on a, a godly woman, somebody, to, a, a partner that will pray with you and uh, suffer with you and cry with you and go through terrible, terrible things and come out uh, praising God on the other side. <clears throat> So, I get out of college, three weeks out of college, we're married, three months later, we're with child. So, life happened real fast, and it kind of smacked me in the face, uh, got insanely busy with work, and uh, the, the sad thing is, and I know this happens with a lot of people, the bigger life gets, the smaller we have God in our lives, and uh, I did that. Um, <clears throat> I still had a relationship, still prayed, still, you know, read the Bible, but, but not, uh, not like I should have. My, my time in prayer was more habitual and not, um, not the cherished conversation, uh, that it was before. And, um, I know that this happens a lot with, uh, with people when they get out of school, they're, and they start their lives and their careers and all. Um, they grew up in church, they're on fire, and they get out, and they get cold, and uh, they're not prepared, and they fall away. We, we lose a lot of people uh, in church to that, and, and laziness or whatever you want to call it. Um, and our... Uh, I, mean, I did a little, little research on it. I know the, uh, in the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist Association, I know the, the numbers are, are way down. I feel, like it's, I feel like it's my age group. I feel like it's my age group that, uh, that got busy, and they, they forget about God, and they, they fall away. And uh, it's a sad thing. Um, there's so much strength in church. There's so much strength... In, uh, in the unity of our church, in the, uh, when, I know this weekend is focused on 
unity. Well, when I'm thinking, I'm going to get up here and talk from a bunch of, a guy, bunch of guys, I'm thinking men's fellowship. Men's fellowship. Guys sharing with each other. It's something that I had for so long uh, in college, and uh, I, had some, I had great friends. We prayed for each other. We talked to each other about our issues, our problems and all, and I, we get out. We get out of school. We start working, and we're prideful. We don't need help. We don't ask for help, and we lose that. We lose our, we lose our, our men's fellowship. Uh, here lately, I have been, uh, God has laid on my heart to become more active. Uh, in the last several months, I have, God's been on me about, about my laziness, I guess you'd say. And I work hard. I mean, I build houses, and I'm, you know, physically and mentally, I'm, I'm zapped a lot of times. Um, but I have a, a, I've not been active in, in my church. I'll just be completely honest with you. Uh, here lately, I have been, it's, God's been on me about that. He's convicted me about that. Uh, I have started coming to uh, meet with the men in the morning, on Sunday morning at 7 a.m., and just that little bit of time. And all we do, we talk, for, we hang out, we just kind of talk about whatever we want to talk about for a little while. Then we all voice our concerns, uh, talk about who's having what problems, and, and lift up our, we talk about our prayer requests to each other, and we pray, and uh, that, that little bit, and we don't meet for very long, uh, that little bit has meant the world to me. And, uh, and I, unless we're out of town or something, I, I, I couldn't imagine missing uh, one of those meetings, and I, I appreciate you guys doing that. I know you guys have been doing that for a long time, uh, but I haven't been, and, uh, and I see what I've been missing. Uh, James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I've been missing out for a long time. Uh, I haven't been, uh, I, I, have, I have Christian friends, I have friends that, that aren't here that uh, we talk uh, a little bit, but here, here lately I've been doing a lot better as far as talking to them about, about things of, of God, things that, things that matter, not just, not just shooting the bull, not just uh, talking about empty stuff. We've actually been digging in and, and praying for each other, and uh, it's this, doing this study right here has, has changed me. Uh, it's my, well, I want to be more the person I was when I was in college, when I was on fire. <clears throat> so uh, I know I'm kind of representing the middle age. I know Jeremy said he had somebody that was younger than kind of in my age group, and then one that was a little more experienced, um, and so i I think about me uh, in my age group, and uh, I guess that's called middle-aged. I didn't really want to think of myself as middle-aged, but I have no hair, and um, there's a lot of gray in my beard, and my left knee hurts, and my back hurts right now, so I feel like I'm checking all the boxes off to middle-aged, and Hillary out here lately, she, she likes to say that I'm going through a midlife crisis, so, you know. I guess I'm there. Uh, <clears throat> my group, what, what we've seen is people uh, get busy, they stray away. Life becomes so important to them and they, they, they bring God down so much. Uh, what we see, and, and no, I don't, I don't really do Facebook. My wife does a lot, and not a lot, but she kind of keeps me informed on what's going on. And we see uh, Satan is attacking our group a lot. And our group is, is a large group. There, it's a large group in this church. Um, our group's under attack every day. Our, our marriages are under attack. Our families are under attack. Our, our children are under attack. There is uh, 
Satan is trying to, to destroy us. And, uh, and I know that uh, with my age group, uh, we have the kids. We have, we have our tomorrow's future. And our kids are watching us uh, do well or watching us be lazy. Uh, they're watching us nonstop. Uh, I just can't. Uh, I just can't go on being the person I've been because I know there's a lot of people watching me. Uh, we are strong, but with each other, we are so much more powerful. I want to be more active in this church. We have such a, a great church here, um, and I'm and I'm. I mean, I'm just missing out on it, and I'm ready to stop. Uh, I'm ready to become more active. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I want you guys to hold me accountable for everything I'm talking about here. I want you guys to, uh, uh, to keep me walking a straight line and, uh, and, and watch over each other. Uh, not to be nosy in anybody's business, but there's some, there are people that are, uh, are struggling right now. There's, there's a lot of struggling going on. Whatever it may be, whether it's their uh, work or, or finances or, or home life, marriages, whatever. Um, this last week, uh, I, I know Satan was on me. I got up at like four o'clock, and I've, I'm real. I'm, I'm pretty stressed out at work right now. I got a homeowner that's uh, he's a different kind of fella, not from around here. Pretty high strung. Um, I get one of them every once in a while. Uh, so I get up. I'm laying there in bed, and I feel this weight on me. And, uh, and it's, it's just a pressure of stress. And, I'm, and I get up, and I go out to shop, go in my office, and, uh, and I'm sitting there. And uh, I feel like there's a ton of bricks on my shoulders. And, uh, and I just I, I physically feel a weight on me. And I just, I just stop. I put my books down, and it's like, God. I can't take this. This is this is too much. It's too much for me to bear. This pressure, this this stress that I have on me, I just can't. I can't do it, God. But I know you can. I know you can do it. I and I can handle this as long as you're with me. And and there's no doubt that he's not with me. Uh, I get in the truck a few hours later, and I'm going down the road. And a good buddy of mine, uh, Christian man, he calls me, uh, <clears throat> and he said. You're stressed. I, I can hear it in your voice. And I talked to him just a little bit about it. And uh, I talked to him a lot about it. We probably talked for an hour on the phone, 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, he said, I know you're stressed. I know you got a lot on you. And, and I understand that you are, and, and you have a reason to be stressed. You have a reason to be stressed, for sure, with what, what all you got going on. He said, but God's got this. Uh, he said, God is so big and so strong. And he loves you so much that you've got this. He's got you. You don't need to be worried about what's going on. Uh, and I'm not like in trouble or anything. It's just a stressful time. Um, but that encouragement from my, from my friend, uh, that just put Satan in his place. Because he was, he was hitting me that morning. And this was Wednesday morning. This was just a couple mornings ago. Um, that's what I needed. And I knew right then that that was just kind of the, the exclamation point uh, of this unity weekend, of this fellowship time. Uh, a brother of mine encouraged me in a way that a brother is supposed to encourage you. And I said, man, this, I said, this just lifted off of me. I could feel it. I, fe I, I felt different. So we have a lot of power <clears throat> in that. We have a lot of power and encouragement with each other. Uh, it's so simple. It's such a simple thing that we can do for each other. Ask, ask, how, ask how your week's going. Ask how things are going. And don't just ask emptily, em, empty, ask and mean it. And uh, offer prayer for each other. Uh, this, can, this is a very powerful church. We can be so much more powerful. And this weekend is such, a, such an important thing to us. It's such an important thing to me. 
and uh, and I I love being here. Uh, here here in the last few months, I have loved being in church. I've loved being in God's house more than I maybe ever have. Um, like I say, I, I believe I was missing it for a long time, and uh, and I'm God's working on me right now, and I, I'd appreciate you guys praying for me that uh, that he that. That I, I know that you don't have to pray for God to continue because He's there. He's He's ready for for us to do, uh, to do His work. But pray that I uh, make myself available for whatever He has for me. You know, we are very blessed to have this church. We have a, a blessed group. We have a unique group. I've been to several churches. And I, y'all have to. Uh, I went been to a few up around Murfreesboro and a handful around Fedville, and I've been to some real good churches. But I've never been to one like this. This is, we have a different, we have a different thing going on here. Um, God is really working in this church. Uh, being in the, uh, just started going to the choir and, uh, and looking out and seeing, uh, seeing God work in our church and seeing um, the emotions, the, uh, the Holy Spirit just filling this place. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, well, that's what I got. I appreciate it your time, uh, appreciate your patience, and uh, appreciate your prayers for me. Um, I love you all. All right, can you hear me good in the back? So as most other speakers have started out, Jeremy asked me to do this. I thought, man, um, okay, you know, I'm not I'm usually not that nervous about speaking in front of people. I got a fairly large Sunday school group. I do the business meetings and I talk to a lot of people at work. Seems like when I get up here in the church and speaking and talking about the things of God, I'm real nervous, real quick. Um, so y'all bear with me. Um, I don't know about the women, but the men have had some fabulous uh, speakers. Um, Dylan uh, did a fabulous job. He put a lot of pressure on me um, as a speaker. And then Richard, to say he never speaks and has never, never, and to do as good as he did this morning, I was just amazing, um, really. And then um, we got to hear a lot of truth and wisdom from Brother Chester a while ago. It's just truth. It's truth about how we should be and how a church should be. So um, when they asked me did I want to do it, and I knew we had this LED light bar that we hadn't used yet, and I really wanted to get the light bar flashing, and I wanted to come up out of the corner over here <laughs> on the. But I decided we. I decided it's the sanctuary. We probably need to be a little more reverent, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I do appreciate y'all for being here and giving me some time and attention uh, this morning. So talking about unity, and um, Adam, if you go ahead. Uh, we've kind of heard this around in some today. Is, is 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking who he may devour. And if we don't believe that verse, and we should because the Bible is true from, from cover to cover, but I don't know that we truly think about it and believe it, that he is truly out to get us, especially as a church. And we've heard some of that today, especially on the men's side, about guarding what we have as a church. Um, so he is um, seeking out to destroy us. Adam, um, this picture right here, it's a picture of a video. I did cut out the video. You won't have to watch the rest of it. But um, just like this little elephant uh, who's been singled out by this line, um, you know, he's, he's in a bad spot. But there's no guarantee, no guarantee that this line is going to get this elephant, that he'll fall in this situation. Um, but he has a greater chance of falling because he's out here alone by himself. And that line is zoned in on. And he's made a bad decision. That's, that's just the whole, whole 
point of the pictures. This lion's made a bad decision to be in this spot where he's out here by himself. I mean, the little elephant's made a bad decision to be out here by himself with the lion. And so I thought about our church and um, decisions we make, and I thought, and some of you have heard some of this in my Sunday school class, can our, can our decisions stop the forward progress of the church? And the answer to that is they absolutely can. And, and when I was first studying this and going through it and thought, what will I talk about? I thought a lot about um, Miriam, which that's how I got one of Jeremy's questions last night. So uh, Numbers 12, we talk about Miriam, who spoke out against Moses, marrying an Ethiopian woman. And God strikes her with leprosy. Uh, of course, Moses prays for her, asks God to you know, take that back, heal her. And God does. God's a merciful God. But yet her decision stopped forward progress of Israel for seven days while they waited on her to become clean. Her decision to speak out against God's man stopped the whole forward progress of that church, that nation. You see the analogy. You, you know, bad decision. And then I thought about um, in Joshua 6, Israel was at a high point. And they had followed God's direction, won the battle of Jericho. And you think about that battle and, and you think about how confusing and divisive a direction that they was given to march every day around the city walls one time and then, you know, and then march seven times and blow the trumpets and no talking. And you think, they did that. They had enough faith in God to believe that would work because he said, don't do those things and I'll, I'll be with you and we'll win this. And they didn't do those things. And the walls fell. That's how you know they followed God's direction. So you know every person there followed God's direction and believed in that. But one person made a bad decision, and that was Achan. And in the next battle, Israel lost. It should have been an easy battle. They, they was even talking about how few men they should send to take it. And they lost 36 soldiers. And that was because Achan had kept gold and silver. And he should God told him, don't take anything. But he made a bad decision. Achan's decision cost him, his family, his livestock. When I say his family, I'm talking about him, his wife, his sons, his daughters. They lost their life because of his decision. They were all stoned and burned because of what he did. Bad decision. Israel's forward progress during that time was stopped because of Achan's decision. And his family destroyed him. What about the 36 soldiers that lost their life because of what he did? I have no idea. You know, that, that Achan had done that. Um, it's, a, it's a bad decision. But that really doesn't talk about unity when you're talking about bad decisions in the church. And, and I thought, well, um, maybe we'll talk about my story of unity. And before I do that, I, I want to read a little thing. Um, it's talking about a wedding. It said, the wedding guests have gathered in great anticipation ceremony to be performed today has been long awaited. The piano begins to play the wedding march. The bridegroom and attendants gather in front of the altar. One little girl, um, her flowering hat bobbing, leans to her companion and whispers, isn't he handsome? The response is yes. One by one, the bridesmaid begin to stride, <clears throat> stride in. Several flower girls throw petals on the white and marked cloth. Sound of the organ rises, a joyous announcement that the bride is coming. Everyone stands and strains to get a proper glimpse of the beauty. It says, then a horrible gas explodes from the congregation. This is a bride like no other. In she stumbles, something terrible has happened. One leg's twisted, she limps pronouncedly. The wedding garment is tattered and muddy. Great rents in the dress leave her scarcely modest. Black bruises can be seen on her bare arms. Bloody, her bride's nose is bloody, her eyes swollen. Uh, patches of hair looks like they've actually been pulled from her head. Fumbling over the keys, the organist begins after a shocked pause. The congregation mourns silently. They say, surely the bridegroom deserves better than this. This handsome prince who has kept himself faithful to his love should find consummation with the most beautiful of women, not this. It said his bride, the church, had been fighting again. 
And that's a picture of, of you know, a visualization of what happens when there's um, dysfunction in the church and fighting. And, and, and when you think about it in that way, um, Jesus does deserve so much more. And we're the bride and he's the bridegroom. He, he deserves so much more than even what we give him as a church. And like, and like it's been said today, we're, I agree, we're one of the best that I've ever been to and been around as a whole. I, I would, no place I'd rather be. So when I talk about it, I talk about my story, it, it kind of mirrors some of the things you've probably heard. Um, I've got memories of the old white church. Um, a lot of you call the one we just left the old church. So I'll call it the old, old church. Um, I was brought to church regularly. Maybe like Jeremy says, even before I was born, I, I was being brought to church. Um, taught the Word of God, um, Bible school, Bible drill, whole deal, I'm part of all of that. Um, had friends being saved. Um, I inquired what was happening, what, what was going on. Um, we started talking about you know, being saved, not going to hell. I didn't want to go to hell. Who wants to go to hell? Who's going to, you know, when you're a kid and somebody says, well, they're not going to hell anymore, you, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, so uh, I was saved and baptized. Um, around 12 or so, I thought. Um, moving into junior high, and I've told this before. Um, some of you's heard um, my testimony, but I felt pressure, um, peer pressure. Uh, not that people were pressuring me. It was pressure I was putting on myself. So, so make that clear. It wasn't people pressuring me into things, but I never felt like, I was where I wanted to be. I was never the fastest, I was never the smartest, I was never the strongest, I was just average Joe. Um, so to be included, I felt like I had to try to stand out somehow, be something, be someone. What's, what's your stamp gonna be? Um, and instead of turning to the things of God to make that my stamp, as I got into high school, I turned to other things. Um, I figured out, um, if you're the life of the party, then they'll want you around. And it'll be fun on Monday. Everybody will talk about it. It'll be a big laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Um, one of the biggest blessings I have for my generation, just to be honest, is that there weren't cell phones and pictures everywhere. Because I would hate to know what would be out there today. And I'm just being honest. Um, so I started drinking in high school. I drank a lot, uh, smoking. Uh, people probably knew me for partying. That was my testimony in high school. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of anything I'll say today. Some of it might sound funny and it might be a little, and, and, but I'm not proud of it. I don't, maybe just to ease the tension every now and then there might be a little, but I, I'm not, I'm going to make that clear. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. Um, but it was my testimony. And you can go pull my three high school annuals and it'll prove it. I mean, that's all that's in there. I've hid them from my kids. I've hid the annuals from my kids. If that tells you. I probably should just burn them now that I think about it. But that's a, a, a testimony. It's the truth. It's who I was. And like I said, a lot of things I'm not proud of. But at age 17, um, while I was in high school, I was arrested for public drunkenness. Um, kind of a, you think would be a sobering experience to get cuffed and stuff in the back of the police car at age 17, having to call your uh, dad to come get you out of jail because that's where you are. Um, being a minor, right? Um, I will say this about my dad. He said, um, when he got me out of jail that night and he's driving me home, he said, no matter what anybody thinks or says, I still love you. And I didn't really understand the statement as well right then. But I knew that had to be hard on him and, and mom, as parents, as, as whatever, to have to think about me, one, two, what does that look like? I mean, let's be honest. But I understood the statement. And, and, and more as I get older do I appreciate it more. But that was the summer before my senior year. So now I have no license. I'm a senior in high school. I have no license. Um, started dating Jan. When me and Jan started dating, my dad had to carry us around. Uh, so 
She probably really liked me or she wouldn't have lived through that. So, um, she's, uh, but how embarrassing, right? Grounded, uh, no license. I can, uh, they did let me drive to church and school. That was legit. They was a, had a juvie officer, the whole deal. Um, I was also grounded the summer before for wrecking a car on Milana Road. I'm not telling my dad about it till the next day. So um, the reason I say those things is mainly for the parents here in part for a second is my dad kept his thumb on me short of sending me to military school just about as much as you could without just you know, completely alienated. I mean, he, he grounded me, they fussed at me, they watched me, they controlled my curfew. It just didn't slow me down. And I'm not telling the kids in here that's a green light to keep going. It's not. What I'm telling the parents is sometimes you just can't do no more. And the, the kids are going to do what they want to do. You just got to keep doing your part. Praying, talking to them, telling them what's right. Don't give up on them. Tell them you love them. But some, they're just going to do, they're, they're people. They got minds, and they'll, they'll make their own decisions. I scaled back for a little while, but it wasn't because of conviction. It was only wrong because I got caught. I was trying to figure out how I wouldn't get caught next time. Um, started pulling people in with me. I'm drinking. Um, was at church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night during this time. Just want everybody to know that. Never quit coming to church. Um, showing up. But that's where I think part of unity begins. And, and I've never asked them, so when I make these next few statements about um, a couple people, I just have to believe in my heart they knew. They knew who I was and what I was doing. Jason Ogle being my best friend, I doubt there was any, mm, well, doubt in Mr. Harold and Ms. Sarah's mind of, what I was doing. I, I find it hard to believe they didn't know I'd been arrested. Now, I've never asked them. But I believe it. I believe they knew. I believe they knew what I was doing one way or another. But Mr. Harold and Miss Sarah never treated me any different. Never. Miss Brenda Hatley was our Sunday school teacher. She knew. She never treated me any different. I know she knew. I know for a fact she knew. Always welcome. Always knowing what I was doing. Always welcome. Never pushed me away. Always welcome me in to try to influence me the other way. It's very easy to push me away in both situations. It's very easy for Mr. Harold and Ms. Sarah not to want me around. Me. I mean, Jeremy was around. You know, what was he saying? Not just because he is today, because he was young. Jamie was around. Never, never treated me any different. I never felt like Pleasant Hill was a place where I wasn't wanted. Never. I felt embarrassed sometimes. But never felt like it wasn't a place I was, I was wanted. <clears throat> Moving on to college, I started skipping college classes uh, because I'd stay out all night, places I shouldn't be. Um, got into a fight with my parents, my fault my fault. Left, uh, moved in with a friend, <clears throat> quit college, quit my job, and broke up with Jan all in the same week. Viral. Out. Um, another thing about my dad, uh, my fault, I told you the fight was my fault when I left. Um, he drove to the friend's house later on and said he loved me and he was sorry. Please come home whenever I want. 
I did. I went back. I appreciate those moments with my dad. Didn't deserve them. Quit coming to church after that, though. I just quit coming. Um, started work <clears throat> with the company I work for today, 19 years old. I'm only 19 by this point, by the way. Um, that did nothing but take me further down the road at the factory. Um, if you've ever lived in a factory or worked in one, I mean, you understand. Um, partying every opportunity, any day, any shift. Um, I was gambling, uh, drinking, drinking by myself. Um, one blessing in my life was I never did drugs. Didn't like them, didn't, never had that. I liked to drink. I wanted to drink. But I never did drugs. And, and my problem with addiction and, and alcohol, the way I like it, and the way I smoked for so many years, I don't, you know, it makes you wonder if I'd ever got into drugs, would I kick? Yes, I can. Anything's possible for God. But I, I really, really counted a blessing that He kept that from my life. Because I don't know that I could control it during this time without Him. It could have been bad. Uh, but no drugs. Um, around age 20, 21, tired of that life, um, it, it wears on you after a while. Um, Jan and I got back together, we got married, we got married in the old church. Uh, Brother Milton married us, uh, he talked to us before we got married, I told him we was, I was saved, but I wasn't. I went to church every once in a while, um, whatever. Uh, we moved into a new house, um, built a house, I got some promotions at work. We've heard about life taking over, just getting busy and more. But, you know, the testimony we heard earlier was God was in their life and life took, you know, God took a back seat. Well, God wasn't in my life. It just, I just let life take over completely. I'm still having some problems. Um, like I said, me and Jan are married. Um, I'm still drinking. Um, I'm just really struggling at this time. I'm not, I'm not sure anybody knows how bad I was struggling. Okay on the outside, definitely not okay on the inside. I had a, had a lot of anger issues um, back then. I, keep, I kept a lot of anger for a lot of years, even after I got saved. It was something I had to work on harder than anything and for nothing. I don't know where it comes from now when I look back. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but I had a lot of anger issues. And, and, and I don't want you to think I'm saying I'm, I'm contemplating suicide or nothing, but... I was making life miserable for me. I was making life miserable for Jan. Um, I was just struggling. Working all the time, things back and forth. And like I said, I've really talked to no one about this before, but, but I was in a bad place. And, and I was kind of hinting around to Jason one day, and I didn't just come right out and say it, but I was talking about the things I'd done and, and the things I had in my mind and, and the confusion and the, just the general chaos that I felt like I was in. I can't even remember where we were going. But I'll never forget what he said. And, and he said, I don't know about anybody else, but Jesus will forgive you. That's all he said. That's all he said. And I'll never forget it. Even though I wasn't saved, it, it tuned me back down. It started... I do believe it was a push in, in one direction. So he could have very easily, uh, yeah, man, roll with it. Do what you got to do. Live life, whatever. I mean, I mean what? But he, he gave good, good, good counsel as a friend. You need friends like that. Uh, we was on the visitation list. Um, Brother Milton and Brother Jack Sims come by and stop us, see us on visitation night and invite us to church. Still wanting us, right? Still come on to Pleasant Hill. Come by. We, we want you. Uh, Jan starts going regularly. She's taking Tyler. Um, she comes home and says, people ask about me, want to know where I'm at. As Ryan said this morning, made me extremely mad. Dan had come home from church. I'd still be in bed. I worked third shift. That was my excuse. I was going to have to go in that night. 
She'd say, hey, such and such asked about you at church today, and I'd be fuming. I'd just be mad. There'd be a fight. She'd, she'd catch all of it because of that. Not fair to her because people asked about it. And I knew I needed to be here. I knew where I needed to be. That's why I was mad. It wasn't somewhere else. It wasn't, wasn't home. It wasn't laying in that bed for sure. Um, I thought, man, don't they know I work? <laughs> but that was just me trying to convince me. Um, around age 26, somewhere around in there, Sunday morning, I'm sleeping. Jane comes in there and wakes me up, which is a danger move if anybody's ever had to wake me up. <laughs> ask Ryan, ask Jan. They, when I worked midnights and lived at home, they used to send Ryan in there to wake me up because nobody else would come do it. Uh, danger move there. And then she said, it's the phone. It was Jeremy Ogle asking me, was I coming to church today? I was mad, shamed, glad, arrayed of emotion at that moment. I'm just honest. But how hard was that for him to be my friend and call me like that on Sunday morning? Made me, made me feel woman. But he done it in love, not judgment. Unity. He done it in, in, in unity. I never took it to church. Started going more on Sunday mornings. Um, eventually was saved. Um, like I said, I'd always known Jesus was a head knowledge. I, I could answer most trivia questions, which Jeremy got me on some last night, but I could, you know, I could play that game. I could do the Bible drill. Uh, and I knew him in my head. But after that, after I got saved, I knew him in my heart. And that, that's where he's got to live, is in your heart, not in, not in your head. Um, have I been perfect ever since? Not even close. Not even close. And if I let the devil talk me into it, I wouldn't be standing up here today because you wouldn't have to go no further than this week to find something that I've messed up on. That I shouldn't have done, shouldn't have said, shouldn't have acted. And he'll hold us all down from serving the devil. That you're not good enough. You've done something. If the... We're not perfect. We're not supposed to be. He is. Now, that was a pretty good list. And, and there's others. And, and I didn't want to talk about everybody. I, I, I wanted to talk about the ones I knew for sure. But And I'm not saying I couldn't have been saved if these people hadn't have been nice to me. That, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, God can do what needs to be done. And will do what needs to be done. But how much easier... Was it for me to come back to Pleasant Hill after all I'd done, knowing all those people cared about me? So easy. It was such an easy thing. The hard part was dealing with the conviction once you got here. It wasn't the people. And would I have come back if everybody had been talking about me or talked about my family or made me feel inferior because of the decisions I made, the bad decisions, I don't know. And people could have talked about me. I don't know. It never got back to me if it did. There's a family I know this for a fact. They left a church because people gossiped about their kids. Their kid got a, a girl pregnant out of wedlock and, and the church talked about them and they left. And you can't get them back in church today. Now that's between them and the Lord. That ain't, that'll, that'll need to be settled between them and the Lord. But what a horrible testimony for that church. How many people have they told don't go to that church unless you're perfect because they're going to run you down.
we, we really can't afford to be like that as a church. And I tell you that story, and I pull those instances out of my testimony to let you know how, how easy it was for me to come back after bad decisions had been made. It was easy. And we're all going to make bad decisions. The difference is sometimes yours won't be as bright and as bold and as highlighted as mine was. Or somebody else. But you got to understand where they're at. You remember the uh, elephant that made the bad decision? Um, luckily, um, his herd had unity. Uh, they surrounded him and protected him after the bad decision, and they didn't leave him out there to face the lion alone. And that's what we got to do. We're way too quick as Christians, not just as, to, to, inside the church, to pick somebody apart because they're here, they're with us. They should know better. I think is our problem. I'm not saying that, I'm just me. They should know better. Because if the lost person from outside was doing the same thing, we'd be out there dragging them in this church if we thought they'd come. Somebody in the church do the same thing, and, and we'll gossip about them, we'll tell, we'll tell everybody. Um, the definition of unity, which Dylan then gave us one, so I'm, he, he kind of uh, went by me on that, so I'm, uh, is, is condition of harmony, meaning accord, and the, quali and the quality or state of being made one. And like Dylan, I thought, that's okay, but what does the Bible say? And in Ephesians 4, he says, There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you. One. How many times does he say one? One. We're to be one. And we can't do that if, we, if we're going to you know, separate and, and kick people out. I think the definition of unity is love. In John 3.16, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Verse 34 says, Love one another as I have loved you. As Edie has so eloquently put recently, love like Jesus. Now, if Jesus loves me, for everything I did, and I didn't tell y'all one quarter of it, but if Jesus loves me for everything I did, so are you supposed to. And as far as I'm concerned, this church has. That, that was my testimony, that they did. But I'm asking you to think about everybody else. So as Jesus has loved you, you are to love me, no matter what they've done. And he says in verse 35, he says, this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. That's how the world's going to know that we're his, is the love we share. Do you think people really want to be a part of this church? Is that when we're out there, they hear us gossip about each other in here? And when I say gossip, true or false, I don't care. I don't care if it is true. But we're out there talking about each other in the public, burning each other down. To our friends, to each other, it doesn't matter. If people hear it, what kind of testimony does that give? He tells us to love one another. Um, I think about Achan. I think about the lady brought before Jesus. And, and Achan was directed by God, so it's not really exactly the same thing. But I think about that for a minute, and I think when somebody in the church does something wrong, do we drag them in the street and stone them? Is that our first action? Is that really what we're doing? Are we surrounding them with love, telling them to be okay? And what do you need to get out of this problem? What do you need from me to get out of this problem? That's really what we should be doing. Um, as a community, he says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So let's go show community that we love one another, we love Jesus that we are that herd. And when people stumble in here, let's back them up, not burn them down. That's all I got. Thank you.